the principle of the law. We need to be impressed concerning the principle of the law. God's dealing with His people always depends upon a principle. For example, God's dealings with Abraham were based upon God's promise. God did not give Abraham the commandments of the law; He gave him only the promise. Thus, God dealt with him according to His promise. The promise given by God to Abraham became the principle according to which God dealt with him. Later, God gave the law to the children of Israel through Moses. The law given on Mount Sinai thus became the principle according to which God dealt with the children of Israel. In this way, the law became the principle for God's dealings with His people in the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, God deals with His believers according to faith, no longer according to the law. This is fully developed in the books of Romans and Galatians. If you read these books, you will see that God deals with the believers in Christ not according to the law, but according to faith. In Old Testament times, God accepted people according to the law. If anyone wanted to be accepted by God, he had to meet the standard of the law. But today, God accepts us not according to the law, but according to whether or not we believe in Christ. Thus, God's acceptance of us today is based on faith. The commandments of the law not abolished, but uplifted. The fact that God no longer deals with us, the believers, according to the principle of the law, does not mean that the commandments of the old law had been abolished. For instance, the first two commandments of the old law were concerned with not having other gods and with not making images. To say that the principle of the law has been abolished does not mean that these commandments have been abolished. Rather, according to the New Testament, these commandments are emphasized, strengthened, and uplifted. In the Old Testament, we were told not to make a physical image, but in the New Testament, we are told that even our covetousness is a form of idolatry; greediness is an idol. By this, we see the uplifting of the commandment regarding idolatry. Yes, the principle of the law have been abolished, but not the commandments of the law. The commandment about honoring our parents has never been abolished. In the New Testament, this commandment is also repeated, strengthened, and uplifted. We must honor our parents much more today than the children of Israel did in the past. We have seen that the Lord Jesus also uplifted the commandments regarding murder and adultery, because the Old Testament commandments regarding murder and adultery were not adequate. The Lord complimented them. The Old Commandment concerning murder did not cover the matters of hatred or anger. Thus, the Lord complimented the Old Law concerning murder by saying that anyone who was angry with his brother would be liable to judgment. He also complimented the Commandment concerning adultery by saying that anyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her in his heart. By these examples, we see that the moral laws have never been abolished; rather, they have been uplifted. All of the Ten Commandments have been repeated and uplifted in the New Testament, except the Fourth Commandment, the commandment to keep the Sabbath. This commandment is over because it is not related to morality; instead, it is a ritual commandment. A higher standard of morality. Now we come to my real burden in this message. Yes, in the New Testament, salvation is based upon the principle of faith. It has nothing to do with the law. We all have been saved through faith, not through the keeping of the law. But after we are saved, we must live a life that has a standard of morality higher than that of the old law. Never think that we are free to be loose, sloppy, or even immoral just because we are not saved through the keeping of the law. Do not think that just because God does not deal with us according to the principle of the law, but according to the principle of faith, we should not care for the commandments of the law. 
Anyone who thinks this has been drugged by the teachings found in part of today's Christianity, we must be sober. Again, I say, after we have been saved, we need to live a life with a standard far higher than that of the old law. Our standard must be higher than that of the requirements of the law. The law requires that we should not murder anyone, but we should not even be angry with others, even if we say to our brother Raka an expression of contempt or mori, a word of condemnation indicating a rebel. We shall be in danger of the judgment, although we may not kill our brother if you. We even call him a fool or a rebel. We shall find ourselves a serious trouble. The problems of temper and lust. In Matthew five, the Lord Jesus spoke about murder and adultery. Murder refers to our temper and adultery to our lust. Our temper and our lust constantly damage and trouble us. If we were stoned, we would not be bothered by these two things, no matter how much we irritate, insult, or, or offend a stone. It will never react because it does not have any temper. Furthermore, a stone has no lust, thus it can never be tempted by lust. But daily, we are either troubled by our temper or tempted by our lust. How easy it is for us to be irritated and offended. Some of us may be offended at least ten times a day. You may be offended by your husband or wife, by your children, by your neighbors, or by your in-laws. You may even be offended by your shoes, the stove, or the tea kettle. I know some sisters who have been offended by their kitchens. It seems that their anger could never be exhausted. Others are troubled with lust. For this reason. I pointed out in one of the life study messages on Genesis that you should never be alone with a member of the opposite sex for any length of time. If you are, you will be tempted by your ferocious lust.